Hello there, my lemon heads, and welcome back to the Lemonade Stand, or welcome if you are new. My name is Brianna. I'm a certified personal trainer, a big, huge biology nerd, and a registered dietitian to be. We are gathered here today for episode two of my newest series, True Science. This is a series in which I've combined my love of science with my interest in true crime. In this series, we talk about everything from doctors who turned out to be frauds, crazy medical phenomenon, mad scientists, and everything in between. On tap today, the late Donald Gary Young. Before we proceed, if you love science-based health, wellness, and fitness education with some lols and some very dry sarcasm along the way, hit that subscribe button and join the lemonade stand. I would seriously love to have you here. Without further ado, let's make lemonade. Ooh, so episode two, true science, you guys, hell yes. So. Donald Gary Young, who I will refer to as Gary Young or just Gary henceforth. Have you heard of this guy? Well, he was a piece of work. Many of you may know him as the founder and former CEO of the multi-level marketing company, Young Living. Many of you may know him as the baby on a liver. We're gonna chat about it all. But in the meantime, let's start from the beginning. That's typically the best place to start a story. Also, um, it's December and if you guys haven't caught on, I do like to be festive and this is my festive contribution. These are cat ears with like red and green jingle bells on them. Um, I don't have a cat. <laughs> I have three dogs, but I just thought that these were really cute. And the only other option when I was at the store was just way too distracting. So I'm wearing these, yes. So on a sunny, beautiful day in July in the year 1949, Donald Gary Young was born. I have no idea if it was a sunny day or not. I'm just assuming it was because it was July. I'm just trying to paint a pleasant picture now because things are gonna get pretty unpleasant. <laughs> Gary Young was born in Idaho. Did you guys know that Sark has some potatoes from Idaho? He doesn't talk about it much though. So Gary was the second oldest of six children and it was said that he really enjoyed the outdoors. I imagine that he was probably one of those kids that like rolled around in the dirt or whatever caught fireflies, stuff like that. He was also raised in a Mormon household, which may or may not be relevant to the things that are later to come. I don't know, but he was raised Mormon. Because multi-level marketing runs so rampant in the Mormon community and a lot of religious communities in general, I have found, I don't think it's too crazy to assume that maybe his Mormon background maybe played a hand in the development of his multi-level marketing company. So in 1967, Gary graduated from high school and then he took up a job with the US Forest Service, which I think is a fitting job for someone who loves the outdoors. I bet that was a dream job for him. For those who don't know, the United States Forest Service is an agency of the US SDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. They basically oversee the protection and maintenance of the nation's national forests and protected grasslands. So cool job for someone who loves the outdoors. I mean, not me, but for Gary. So his job with the US Forest Service actually didn't last very long. After he was done there, he actually moved to Canada. In Canada, his goal was to start something called homesteading. And I had no idea what that was. I had to look it up and I still don't fully understand what it is, to be honest. I guess the gist of it is like tending to land and other agricultural stuff like that. Uh, I'm gonna be totally honest. It was not interesting enough for me to wanna learn more about it. So I didn't. Moving on. So when he moved to Canada, he was in his late teens and he homesteaded for a few years and he did it successfully for a time with over 300 acres of land. So in April of the following year, 1968, he met a girl named Donna Jean. According to records, they knew each other for six months and I guess he was just like, damn, this girl's fire, gotta put a ring on it. So he did. They got married after a brief six month courtship. Now, some of you might be a little bit confused to hear that because you probably thought that Mary Young, uh, the current standing CEO of Young Living was Gary Young's only wife, but she was actually not his first wife. Mary Young was actually his third wife. His first wife was this woman, Donna Jean. So Gary and Donna are married. Yay, love that for them. So fast forward to 1973. This is the part of the story that I'm sure many of us have probably heard. He said he suffered a nearly fatal logging accident that left him wheelchair bound. What happened? I have no idea. I couldn't find that information out and from the places I looked, nobody else could either. So I don't know exactly what happened, but apparently it almost killed him. 
at some point in more recent history, his third wife, Mary, actually wrote a book about her husband. And in the book, she detailed some of his injuries after this logging accident. I will list some of his injuries right now. Also be warned, they are pretty gnarly. Three open skull fractures, a ruptured spinal cord, and a broken pelvis. So during his recovery, it was said that he was just depressed and having a hard time. Doctor said he would never walk again, that sort of thing. He even apparently tried ending his own life several times. One of those times he apparently attempted to do so by basically starving himself, which seems like a quite agonizing way to unalive oneself. Or actually, I'm sorry, I guess in 2022, now they call it fasting. <laughs> No, but seriously, that's terrible. Yeah, he starved himself and uh, he basically just consumed water and like lemon juice. So he was in a wheelchair for four months. He was just, you know, working to heal. And it was during his recovery that he became very interested and started to look into alternative medicine practices. So in December of that same year, he took a home study course in nutrition and herbology. So after he was recovered and was finally starting to do better, he returned to British Columbia where he started working as a part-time trucker. Then he was driving a logging truck, then he bought a logging truck. A lot of stuff happening with logs over these next few years. So in 1979, he actually suffered another accident. What happened again, I don't know. But it was enough for him to be like, man, I am done with logs. They are too dangerous. I don't know if that's exactly what he said, but you get it. So he sold his logging truck and eventually actually went back to school. Yay! Love that for him, great. Well, except it wasn't a real school. <laughs> well, not a, not what generally people would consider a legitimate school, I should say. He enrolled at a place called the Burroughs Vitaflex Institute. According to an archived article from Business Insider, which I found on the Wayback Machine, which was the source for most of this information, by the way, all sources are linked below always. This school was not accredited and it was based on the teachings of some guy named Stanley Burroughs. Have you heard of Stanley? If you haven't heard of his name, you may have heard of something called The Master Cleanse, which was a book that he wrote. This was a diet that was basically promoted as a detox cleanse type deal and you basically just drink this lemonade concoction that's lemon juice cayenne pepper and maple syrup so let's just skip over the fact that he defiled and disrespected lemons and get straight to the meat it was in the 1980s that the stanley burroughs guy was convicted of unlawfully selling drugs compounds or devices for alleviation or cure of cancer felony practicing medicine without a license and second degree felony murder. And that red rum charge actually came from a cancer patient dying while under his care. It is worth mentioning though, that eventually that second degree red rum charge was, um, did end up being overturned. Also, in case you haven't caught on, I don't want this video demonetized. So red rum was my code word for Okay, so Gary Young is enrolled in this school by Stanley Burroughs. Great, love that for him. At this point in time, he's in Sacramento, California. From this, he got his certification to practice reflexology after he studied nutrition, reflexology, and something called color therapy. <laughs> color therapy. So in the space of time between 1979 and 1981, he took courses at Don's Back Nutrition University, which sounds hilarious. That's like a fake medical school being called Doctor University. So this school was also unaccredited and it was operated by a man named Kurt Donsbach, who was an unlicensed chiropractor and also just another one of your, one of those scandalous alternative medicine quacks that we hear about. So this Kurt guy was actually actually convicted not once, but twice of practicing medicine without a license. Some of his other charges included things like saying he had a cure for cancer. He promoted certain things as cures for, for medical conditions, but these are actually medications that were counterfeit and made with illegal or dangerous ingredients. On top of the Stanley Burroughs guy, I could also probably do a video on this guy too, this Kurt Donsbach guy. I went down so many rabbit holes researching for this video, you guys don't even know. So anyway, Gary is attending school, which according to the court documents, a lot of this is according to court documents as well, by the way, that included a mix of home study and attending campus for lectures and such. He was a regular L Woods. So it was also around this time that Gary and his wife Donna moved to Spokane, Washington. And in June of 1981, they opened up an herb shop and nutrition type deal. 
No, not an Herbalife cafe. It was also during their time in Spokane that Gary actually went to real school finally, <laughs> like an actual legit school. He took some pre-med classes at Spokane Community College. I think it's safe to say, however, that he did not complete the required coursework to become a medical doctor. Otherwise, I doubt I'd be making this video. According to this Business Insider article, he attended classes for a quarter of a semester. <laughs> What, that's like a month. It was also around this time that he took classes at a place called the American Institute of, I'm sorry, I have to look down and read, Physio Regenerology. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. The founder of this school, who was a guy named Mike Mayer, he told the Spokesman Review in 1986 that Gary had left the school entirely, quote, after attending only a few classes, doing a third of the homework. Gary also left owing this Mike Mayer guy over $1,800 in tuition. So something else about Gary's credentials or lack thereof, should I say. According to the Skeptical Inquirer, Gary claimed to have earned a doctorate degree in naturopathy from a place called Bernadine University. However, Bernadine University is described as a fraudulent diploma mill. One of those deals where you just mail a check to somebody somewhere and they send you back the degree of your choice. As a reminder, diploma mills are 100% legal in the United States. I'm losing my voice. I've been filming all day. <clears throat> okay, so we're about to get to the part of the story that you all knew was coming. Gary Young basically causing the death of his newborn infant daughter. This is horrendous and despicable. Consider this your trigger warning. Okay, so Donna Jean and Gary had six kids together. Sidebar, I did not know he had that many kids. I feel like the ones that we mainly hear about are his two kids that he has with Mary, uh, Jacob and Joseph Young. According to some sources I read, Gary actually had like 10 kids between all of his wives. This man could not pull out of a damn driveway. So anyway, Gary and Donna have six kids and at some point she becomes pregnant with their seventh. At this point in time, she's pregnant with their seventh and it's time to have the baby. Gary had actually delivered four out of their six children without any medical supervision. And remember, without being an actual, you know, healthcare professional. So I guess he thought he would give delivering another one a try. According to Business Insider, Gary apparently held an early belief that infants delivered underwater could be immunized against various illnesses. You guys, I don't know. I don't know. So I guess this is the method that he thought he would try with their seventh baby. In September of 1982, in a health club that he owned and operated, he attempted to deliver their baby daughter, whose name is Rachel, in a whirlpool bath. I'm sure we've all heard of water births before. It is a thing, but it's generally done in a safe, sanitary, controlled environment with actual trained medical professionals supervising and on standby. This was not that. After baby Rachel was delivered, I guess Gary thought that it would be a good idea to leave her underwater for close to an hour. Now, I, like many of you watching this, know that human infants are not typically born with gills or any other similar underwater breathing apparatus. So because of that, what do you think happened to little baby Rachel? The Spokane County coroner at the time, Lois Shanks, examined Rachel's body and determined that she was, quote, normal and healthy, end quote, upon her birth. In 1983, Shanks told the Spokesman Review that had she been able to have a hospital delivery, she likely would have had an easy birth and probably would have survived. Rachel's official cause of death was oxygen deprivation. So after this story, okay, my husband put all the dogs in here. Chewing noises are Zeus chewing on his Kong. Leave him alone, he's adorable. So after this story was published in the newspaper, they actually contacted Gary for a comment. Gary's only remark was, quote, there are more damn hazards in the hospital than out of the hospital, and there are enough damn statistics to prove it, end quote. Was he even a little bit sorry? At this point, I would love to tell you that Gary was arrested and convicted of something, anything, but if I did, I'd be lying. He was never arrested and convicted of any crime in regard to his daughter's death, which was ultimately ruled as accidental, which is truly unbelievable. I don't understand how he even got away with at least a, like a child endangerment charge or something. However, this whole incident did get the authorities' attention. I would love to know how that conversation went among the officers. Hey, this guy left his baby underwater for an hour and it died. Hmm. We should probably look into that. Yeah, you probably should. FYI, shortly after this incident, he and Donna Jean uh, began divorce proceedings. The reason for their divorce, only they know, but 
I would not be surprised if it had anything to do with him basically unaliving their daughter and seemingly having no remorse for it. I mean, we don't know and we will likely never know what was said behind closed doors, but that statement that he gave the newspaper, in my opinion, was very telling. So Donna left and took the kids back to Canada, remember, because she's Canadian. Donna was really like, I am straight up not having a good time. This uh, little bit right here is unrelated, but it was very interesting and I wanted to add it in. According to the court documents, while the divorce was pending and Donna had custody of the kids back in Canada, Gary was apparently paying her $900 a month in child support. $900 for six children. <laughs> now granted this was 1983, I checked online and the modern equivalent to that amount is like uh, $2,700. But I just feel like that doesn't seem like a lot for six kids. Or maybe it is, I don't know, I don't know. You guys know me and my husband are child free by choice. We don't have kids, don't want kids, have no plans of having kids. But I know those damn things are not cheap. <laughs> so are any of you watching this, like do you pay child support for six kids? <laughs> if so, how much? I hope that's not like too invasive of a question to ask. I'm just, I'm genuinely curious. Or are any of you watching this, are you a parent to six kids? What's your opinion? Do you think $2,700 a month is enough for six kids? <laughs> six kids sounds like a goddamn nightmare. <laughs> anyway, so remember I just said, he wasn't arrested or convicted of any crime in connection with his daughter's death, but I did say this incident got the authorities' attention, right? So that same year in 1983, Spokane PD went undercover to investigate this Gary guy. They sent two officers in to pose as a pregnant couple seeking medical advice and other services. I don't know if the female officer was actually pregnant or if they just like put a pillow under her shirt. Either way, love the commitment to the role. So this couple reached out to Gary under the guise of seeking alternative methods for the delivery of their child. They told Gary that they'd had complications with their last birth and wanted to try something different. So at their appointment, that's what they discussed. At some point during the appointment, chronic disease was brought up and one of the officers mentioned cancer. He told Gary that his mother-in-law had cancer. Gary said that he could treat cancer through alternative means, such as through the use of vitamins, minerals, diet, and enzymes, okay? Then Gary tells them that there's a special lab. Oh my God, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> Then Gary tells them that there's a special lab in Salt Lake City, Utah, that can test your blood for things like, quote, body deterioration, end quote, and quote, compatibility for food and food supplements to avoid allergic reactions, end quote. I'm quoting court documents here, by the way. These are the court documents according to his first arrest. So undercover cop is like, sounds swell. Can we do it? Gary says, yeah, sure. So they set up an appointment to do this blood test. So now let's jump ahead some time. I don't know, let's say like a week. And now we're at the appointment for this. I wanna take this time to bring up a red flag. <laughs> Or when you were at the doctor or with someone who was, you know, your healthcare provider. Apparently, according to the court documents, Gary says he can't draw up the guy's blood himself. So he gives the patient, who remember is an undercover cop, a diabetic syringe and is like, do it yourself. <laughs> Okay, so I know this is a sting operation, right? So the cops already have a pretty good idea that this guy's a phony. But for all of you watching this, I just want to say, this is a red flag. <laughs> I'm sure most, if not all of you watching this have had blood drawn before. I certainly have. I'm fairly certain that the doctor will never, never, give you a syringe and tell you to draw your own blood. They will usually send you down the hall to the lab and have the phlebotomist do it. So Gary gives the guy the syringe and then the patient's like, I gotta pee. And he excuses himself to the bathroom. In the bathroom, I assume, is where he calls his other cop friends who were hanging out on standby. And he's like, hey, you guys come and bust this guy. He's trying to make me stick myself. Or I don't know what he said, you know what I mean? So the cops promptly show up and arrest Gary Young. At trial, Gary pleads guilty to practicing medicine without a license. He was sentenced to one year of probation, ordered to serve 60 days in the county jail, suspended, in order to pay $250 in fines. That'll show him. So let's jump forward some time and Gary is still on probation for practicing medicine without a license. He decides he's gonna open up a health company in Chula Vista, which is a uh, town in the um, San Diego area. Fun fact, I used to live in San Diego. I absolutely loved it. It was in San Diego that I actually graduated high school and started college. And personally for me, San Diego is right up there um, with Austin and Brianna's top 
favorite places she's ever lived. Yeah, love San Diego. It's a good vacation spot too if you never visited. Also, another fun fact, the town, the part of San Diego that I lived in was Coronado. If you are a true crime junkie, you may have heard of the case of Rebecca Zahau and Max. I'm sorry, I don't remember the little boy's last name, but um, the, the case where the little boy falls off the banister under mysterious circumstances and then uh, his stepmom or his dad's girlfriend, the Zen found dead the next day under mysterious circumstances. That happened in Coronado, California. I lived in Coronado when that happened. Uh, Coronado is a very affluent city. And um, on my way to work, cause I, I used to be a lifeguard. I lifeguarded in San Diego. One of the routes I take to work, if I wanted to take the scenic route, I would take um, Ocean Avenue. And I drove by Spreckles Mansion on my way to work when I took Ocean Avenue. And I remember when that happened, Spreckles Mansion was absolutely swarmed with news and officers. Uh, for a while, yeah. If you've heard of that case, if you're a true crime junkie like me, I lived in Coronado at the time that that happened. Anyway, not talking about that right now. So anyway, Gary opens up this health company in Chula Vista. Great, love that for him. This company was called Young Life Products. They sold vitamins, colonic tips, extracts, and mouthwash. I thought it was weird that they listed colonic tips in the same sentence as uh, mouthwash. <laughs> But that's that's just what it said. Anyway, so remember his health company, Young Life Products, because we're going to come back to it in a little bit. So a few years later, we're still in the 80s. Gary decides he's going to take a trip south of the border and open up a medical clinic in Rosarita Beach, Tijuana, Mexico. When I was in San Diego, me and all my friends called Tijuana TJ. Does anyone else call it that or is that just me? Also, when I lived in San Diego in Coronado, I was minutes away from the US-Mexico border. Like on a good day, I could get there in less than 15 minutes. So at this clinic, they claimed they had a specialty in treating degenerative diseases. According to the Business Insider article, his relocation south of the border was after, quote, harassment from the orthodox medical profession, end quote. I don't know for sure what he meant by that, but my guess is it was probably like actual medical professionals reporting him for being a fraud and a fake, which he was. They were being such haters. So at this clinic, they offered therapies such as, uh, I'm sorry, I have to look down for this, <laughs> bioelectrical cell activator therapy, blood crystallization tests, and detoxification programs. Uh, apparently he told his patients that he could treat chronic diseases, including, but not limited to cancer, multiple sclerosis, and lupus. At this time, he was promoting himself as a naturopathic doctor for a small fee of $6,000, about $16,000 in today's money. You could take part in his three week cancer treatment program. Oh, plus $280 a week for your accommodations. Sir, those are super host Airbnb prices. According to the Spokane Chronicle, which is another newspaper that reported on Gary, uh, for $10,000, you could even get a cure. I guess they mean a cure for cancer. I'm not really sure. So Gary had set up shop in a new country, but that didn't stop people here in the US from speculating that he was a fraud. One of the tests he ran at his clinic was a blood test, which for a $60 fee, the patient was sent sharp pins and two glass slides. Then the patient sends them their sample at Gary's clinic. And then in the clinic, they test it. So an LA Times reporter heard about this and decided they wanted to try it out. However, they didn't send in their own blood though. This reporter actually sent in the blood of a healthy seven year old kitty. The cat's name was Boomer, by the way, and he belonged to a local veterinarian, you know, an actual legitimate professional. So the reporter is like, here's my blood sample, but it's not. Remember it's Boomer's blood, the cat's blood. But at Gary's clinic, they don't know that. So here's where things get hilarious. Well, it's all hilarious, but you know what I mean. At Gary's clinic, there was this woman named Sharon Reynolds and she held the position of health educator. FYI, Sharon would also read your horoscope for $50. Sharon looks at this blood under a microscope and she's like, man, man, you have super aggressive cancer and your liver is just all messed up. According to Sharon, based on their blood sample, this cancer had just been running amok in this reporter's system for the last four to five years. How devastating. So the reporter is like, oh my God, oh my God, I had no idea. And suggested that they do another blood crystallization test that same day. This time though, the reporter gave their real blood to Sharon. In this test, Sharon found signs of latent cancer, but I guess the cancer wasn't so aggressive anymore. <laughs> However, she did say that the liver problems were still apparent. This time she also added to the list pancreas and thyroid issues too. Sharon suggested another blood test for the near future and she also recommended, quote, 
a supervised program of cleansing, detox, and rebuilding, end quote. The detox program at Gary's Clinic was two grand a week, or you can do an at-home program for $90, plus around $400 worth of vitamins and dietary supplements that you can purchase from Gary's health company in Chula Vista. As a reminder, Sharon Reynolds, this health educator, made her initial diagnosis of aggressive cancer on a healthy cat's blood. And she did not even recognize that the blood she was given was not even human blood. So at a later time, this LA Times reporter decides that they're gonna take Sharon's advice and send him some more blood for another test. This time, however, the blood they sent was blood from a chicken in a Chinatown poultry shop. I'm not sure if it is relevant where the chicken came from, but the LA Times article I found said that. Honestly, that chicken was probably a delicious meal by the afternoon. I'm sorry, I know some of my viewers are vegan slash vegetarian. I'm sorry, I'm just being realistic here. Oh man, we just had to take a short break. Uh, I have been filming all damn day. It's five o'clock. I've been filming since like 11.45. This is my fourth video and my last video and my longest video. The sun's going down, so if the lighting is getting a little bit weird, then I apologize. So anyway, they sent in chicken blood. This is important because chicken blood cells look distinctly different than human red blood cells, primarily because of their shape, they're oval shaped. You would think that any trained professional would know that mammalian red blood cells, human red blood cells, have a shape that is distinctively different than chicken red blood cells. You'd think Sharon would have caught this. Right? Wrong. Sharon diagnosed the chicken blood as if it were human blood. Sharon said that the chicken blood indicated that there was inflammation of the liver. Sharon, you really should have been using science words. I believe you mean hepatitis. Her report also said that the blood looked like it was pre-lymphatic and it looked like that they had undergone a lot of stress in their life, which weakened their immune response. The clinic ended the report with the same recommendation as before with the whole detoxification stuff. <laughs> So as you can tell, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I think it's safe to assume that Sharon probably had very little to no formal training on hematology. The LA Times ended up sending both the cat blood and chicken blood samples to an actual professional, a hematologist, and they didn't offer any context. They just sent the blood and said, here, look at this. The hematologist looked at the chicken blood and immediately thought it was fishy and said, quote, is this human blood? It looks like chicken blood. The hematologist also noted that um, the clinic's, Gary's clinic's uh, diagnostic technique was all wrong as well. The blood should have been smeared on a slide and stained, but it was not. So eventually the LA Times called up Gary's clinic and confronted her about her diagnosis. <laughs> Sharon's defense was she had never seen chicken blood before. So how would she know what it looks like? Which to me is weird because even if I have never seen chicken blood, but I spend a majority of my time looking at human blood samples, which has a distinctly different appearance than chicken blood, wouldn't you, wouldn't you still be like, hmm, well, I don't know what kind of blood this is, but it's definitely not human blood. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't immediately think that. Sharon went on to say that Boomer was not a healthy kitty and that he probably had leukemia or was a carrier of leukemia. Honestly, I admire Sharon's tenacity. Getting caught with your pants down, but still you're committed to your blatantly incorrect assertions. Sharon must've taken a page right out of Autumn Calabrese's book. So to end this chapter of the shit show, I do wanna let you guys know that Boomer the cat was tested for leukemia and he was found to be neither afflicted with it nor was he a carrier. I don't know about you guys, but I trust the veterinarian's analysis of Boomer a little bit more than I do Sharon's analysis. So let's take a break for a minute and check back in. If at this point you are somebody who's thinking, oh my God, well, this is all really messed up, but like, what's the big deal? The big deal is A, it's a crime in the United States to present yourself as a medical doctor and treat people as one when you're not one. In the United States, I have noticed that sometimes to a fault, we hold medical doctors in too high a regard. For example, when a medical doctor tells someone to do keto when it's not necessary, a registered dietitian who is more educated in nutrition and food science than a medical doctor is, looks at that and says, I'm actually, that's not correct. You actually don't need to do keto. That person who doesn't know what a dietitian is or doesn't know that dietitians are more educated in nutrition might hear that and be like, well, my doctor told me that and my doctor is a doctor. So they're right and you're wrong because you're not a doctor. Not realizing that nutrition science and medical nutrition therapy is actually not a physician scope of practice. And also not realizing that physicians, again, have very limited training in uh, nutrition. Because so many people hold medical doctors in such a high regard, you can maybe say that the title of doctor holds a certain sense of power. And we all know with great power 
comes great bullshittery. People like Gary Young take advantage of this and do things to try and give themselves the title of doctor without having the qualifications or education to be actually called a doctor. The other big deal is that Gary Young was taking advantage of people's ignorance, vulnerability, and desperation. They were ignorant because they thought that all of his fancy sounding certificates that he had hanging on the walls of his practice were legitimate. They sound fancy, so they likely thought that his background was legitimate. They were vulnerable because a lot of them were dealing with a chronic disease such as cancer and felt very hopeless. They just want to feel normal and be healthy, but instead they gave their money away and were given instead false hope. And finally, they were desperate because they were sick weak and just wanted a cure and just wanted to feel good. People like Gary Young, and unfortunately there are a lot of Gary Young still today who exist. They see that in people and decide to exploit it for their own personal gain. It's unethical, it's corrupt, it's immoral, and it's dangerous. And you might argue, well, maybe he really thought he was helping people. Okay, in my opinion, the same adjectives still apply though. I think if you really wanna help people, then you would give them information and support that's scientifically proven to work. Not sell them snake oil as a cure for cancer, especially because you keep getting in trouble with the law. So like you're not putting two and two together that what you're doing is wrong. <sighs> Believe it or not, you guys, we are nowhere near done with this story. So where are we at now? The year is 1988 and the state of California is tired of Gary's tomfoolery his skylarkings, if you will. So they file a complaint against him for his health company. Remember the one in Chula Vista? In this injunction, they allege, quote, unfair, deceptive, untrue, and misleading advertising and unlawful, unfair, and fraudulent business practices, end quote. And the reason for this is because he sold and produced unapproved medical devices and drugs and advertised that his company could cure cancer and other diseases, according to court records. Also on this injunction, it listed Gary's name, a guy named Richard Crow Jr. and a Dixie Young. So Dixie was actually Gary's second wife. I could find basically no information on her and their marriage. Just know that his second wife's name was Dixie. I just wanted you guys to know that because remember his last wife that we talked about, her name was Donna Jean. And I told you guys he had three wives, but I didn't want to just skip to Mary Young without letting you know about the wife in between. So the second wife's name was Dixie. No information on her, but his second wife's name is Dixie Young. Anyway, so a lot of medical professionals saw this injunction and they decided that they would debunk a lot of the treatments that Gary offered, which honestly was probably not very hard to do. They all arrived to pretty similar conclusions that Gary's methods were not based in science and were ridiculous. According to Business Insider, one doctor even said that Gary's methods were closer to mysticism than they were science. <laughs> this whole case was settled out in 1989. So let's back up real quick and go back to 1988. Gary was arrested for violating the terms of his parole, which was related to uh, that first arrest that we talked about when he was in Washington. And he ended up spending a whopping one month in jail for it. Also in 1988, Gary was hit with another lawsuit filed in the Superior Court of San Diego. This one was brought against him by a former employee in his uh, clinic in Mexico. The employee alleged that they gave Gary and his, and his wife, Dixie, $100,000, which was supposed to be for the clinic, but instead they kept it for personal personal use. The suit also alleges that the Youngs embezzled corporate money and failed to disperse insurance payments that had to be paid to the clinic. These funds were supposed to be reimbursed back to patients. Two years after this, and after he finished his jail time, which I just mentioned, which I'm sure totally turned him into a changed man, Gary was ordered to pay back his former employee $100,000. So, Essential oils. Finally, we're getting to the goddamn essential oils. What a whirlwind this has been. This video is going to be hell to edit. All right. Here we go. So according to court records, by the late 1980s, Gary had started a multi-level marketing company, which was called Young Life International. They distributed products like colon aid to rid the body of toxins and liver tone, which rid the liver of toxins. <laughs> These products incorporated essential oils as well as other ingredients such as herbs. Also in the brochure for this company, Gary referred to himself as Dr. Gary Young. So when did he become obsessed with essential oils, you might ask? Well, according to Mary, his third wife, he was introduced to essential oils by a Swiss woman when she brought them to his clinic in Mexico. Apparently this woman gave him an envelope full of research. And from then on, he was just 
enamored with them. So I'm sure most of you know this, but I'm still gonna go ahead and say it anyway. There is little to no scientific research that has conclusively determined that essential oils do anything <laughs> beyond smell good. In fact, there have even been cases in recent years in which depending on how you use them, they can actually be harmful to health. I needed to be clear that I'm not knocking essential oils entirely. I have essential oils in my house. I've used shampoos with tea tree oil extracts and stuff in them. I think I have a conditioner also upstairs that has like tea tree oil extract in it or something like that and oh my god the tingles it's amazing i like essential oils though because they smell good with the knowledge that i have now i would never intentionally inappropriately use essential oils because i know they could be harmful to my health and just not safe overall inappropriate usage can mean ingesting them or using them on mucous membranes two things that we very often see young living consultants do in social media We'll get to Young Living in a minute. In 1993, he finally met his third wife, Mary. They met in Utah at an expo. Mary Young is actually a professional opera singer, which I think is pretty cool. Mary had spent some time in other multi-level marketing companies before, so she did have a little bit of a background in them. According to Business Insider, a former Young Living employee said that Mary held herself out as an expert in multi-level marketing, but also according to that employee, they said that they believe that she was just more of a manipulator. Those are not my words. Those were the former employee's words. So later that year, Gary and Mary revamped his multi-level marketing company and thus Young Living was born. And so was I like a year before. So throughout the rest of the 90s and early 2000s, Young Living experienced considerable growth and things were going pretty well with Gary standing as a CEO. So obviously essential oils had been around for quite some time before this, but before Young Living came about, they weren't as mainstream. Essential oils attracted a lot of people from many different walks of life. Young Living obviously had employees working on the corporate end of things for normal operation, but remember that Young Living took on the multi-level marketing business structure. This means that they, like all multi-level marketing companies, have essentially a workforce of people who they do not have to pay directly for any of the work they do and who basically advertise the company for free. So I think it's safe to say that Young Living Distributors also helped get some of the word out. So from the outside, business was booming and word of the company was spreading like herpes. However, inside on the corporate and Young Living employees, not the same thing as consultants. Some of those employees had come forward saying some interesting things about Gary in the way that he operated. Employees told Business Insider that Gary, quote, had the presence of a cult leader, end quote. Another former employee told Business Insider, quote, there is something oddly charismatic about the guy. People followed him like he was a god, end quote. And that's something that I feel like we see a lot, even today in these Young Living representatives. see so many Young Living reps have this undying devotion to this man and to his company while knowing the many awful transgressions of his past. They just ignore it or when they're confronted with the information, they might explain it away as fake news or give them the benefit of the doubt. I don't understand how you would give someone the benefit of the doubt in all of this, in everything I have told you guys today, but Young Living had and frankly, probably still has a following into the millions. And so many people have this devotion, this allegiance to Gary, it seemed, for the amazing stories that he told surrounding these essential oils. A former employee told Business Insider that one time during a convention, Gary was anointing babies backstage with frankincense oil. According to this employee, these women were just so obsequious, giving this man 
their babies and he would sprinkle some frankincense oil on them. What the fuck, man? Imagine being at a work function and seeing your boss doing some crap like that. That's, that's not a red flag to anybody. According to more information that other former employees told Business Insider, he created what they described as an erratic work environment. And the employees often felt that they had no choice but to acquiesce to what he wanted, despite how insane the request might have been. Other things former employees said about Gary was that he was always wanting to be lavish and go all out, even if it would be a huge inconvenience to everyone. They said that he would do things like demand big, huge changes to the convention, which they had already been planning for a year, but Gary wanted this change to happen. So they all kind of had to scramble to get it done. And quite often it would go over budget too. He also apparently had a love for small planes and bought several, despite company advisors telling him that they were not in the budget. Based on my research, it just seemed like that he was the kind of guy who just wanted what he wanted and you had to give it to him even if it was a huge inconvenience to you and everyone around you. So Gary had this overbearing and intimidating energy about him that based on former employees really bled into the workplace. Eventually this led the company into some hot water, or should I say essential oil. In 2017, Young Living was found to have been illegally trafficking rosewood, which is a species of endangered tree from Peru into the United States. The official offenses were one count of engaging in trade contrary to convention on international and two counts of trafficking in illegally sourced plants. Young Living pled guilty to this crime and was ordered to pay $135,000 in restitution to the Peruvian government on top of a total of $625,000 in total fines, $125,000 thousand of that was to go to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. By this point though, Gary had actually stepped down as CEO of Young Living back in 2015 and his wife Mary was a standing CEO. But I think it's probably safe to assume that he had some involvement in the resolution of this, even if it was from the sidelines. On May 12th, 2018, Gary Young died at the age of 68. His wife Mary said he died of a series of strokes, but his son Sean from his first marriage said that he died of cancer. Who really knows, but I just think um, and I don't want this to like come off as if I'm like shaming someone for dying. You know, that's stupid and awful because you know, we're all gonna die someday. But I feel like 68 is kind of young to die, especially when you consider that human life expectancy is pushing close to 80. Although I don't know, I could be biased cause I'm kind of used to the people in my family living for like a super long time. For example, my paternal grandfather passed away one month shy of his 98th birthday. My great grandfather lived to 107 or 108, I believe. And I also have a great uncle on that side of the family who I think, I think lived to 99 or 100 or something like that. This is all on my dad's side of the family too. Here is a photo of my dad. He is 67 years old and in excellent shape and health. And he does not use essential oils for anything to my knowledge. It's just very ironic that Gary's whole brand and persona was based on health and vigor and vitality. And he died relatively young, I think. Now, I have a personal theory hypothesis that he really did die of cancer as his son, Sean said, but his wife, Mary just says that it was a stroke because cause strokes can kind of come on more suddenly and unexpectedly. If he really did die of cancer, that would invalidate his entire ideology because he has said before and asserted that essential oils can cure and treat cancer. Some reps even still say that. So if he really did die of cancer and that came out and was confirmed, it would be very, very bad for his image and the image of Young Living. You have people out here swearing by these oils to cure every goddamn disease under the sun, but to have their founder, their leader, their messiah, die of one of these diseases would absolutely rock their world. So how he really died, who knows? I mean, I guess we have to just believe what his wife says, but also why wouldn't we believe his own son? I don't know, who really knows? As much as he, sucked when he was alive and as heinous as a lot of his actions were, he still had people in his life who loved him and cared about him. I am sympathetic toward them for, you know, after losing their loved one, but he did some pretty terrible things in his life. So often he just got slapped with a fine and uh, that one time, very little jail time. Why would he stop his behavior if the consequences were so minimal? I never knew Gary Young, obviously, but based on all my research for this video, my opinion of him is that he seemed like somebody who apparently thought that they were above the law. His expertise was far beyond what us normies could possibly understand. Despite the fact that this man held absolutely no legitimate accredited educational background. The Dunning-Kruger effect is truly unbelievable.
I want to do a video on that. I want to do a video on influencers and Dunning-Kruger one of these days. Oh my goodness, what a ride that was. If you are still watching this video, comment oily, because I really need to know if you're still here, because if you are, you are the real MVP. Thank you so very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Even if you only watched half an hour of it, I really appreciate it. Researching for this video was such a whirlwind. And if you could believe it, I actually left a lot of stuff out just for time. Like as recently as 2016, Young Living ran into trouble with the IRS. They've gotten in trouble with the FDA a few times because a lot of their reps were publicly saying that their oils could treat or cure diseases. In one instance, they implied that their oils could treat Ebola. I actually did a video on a recent FDA warning that Young Living got for more health claims being made by their reps. From 2019, they were faced with a class action lawsuit from a former consultant who was alleging that they were operating as an illegal pyramid scheme. Of course, they denied that allegation. It's wild, it's truly wild. All right, that concludes episode two of True Science and I have been filming all day and I am exhausted and I am hungry. Once again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you watching and I appreciate your support. Um, if you enjoyed this video, hit the like button. Let me know how you liked episode two of True Science. Let me know what's going on in your brain after all this. If you enjoyed me and my rambling, subscribe for even more. Always stay hungry for the truth, but don't forget to have a healthy dose of skepticism as well. Queen Lemon, over and out.